it is the lowest place on the face of the earth. The sea is so salt, nothing can live in it. Yet, in small settlements along the west bank of this Dead Sea, Jewish scholars once sought refuge from the moral decay of their time. The refuge ended shortly after the time of Christ. Roman conquerors were tightening their stranglehold on the Holy Land. Even the suggestion of dissension was intolerable. So, the emperor's legions crushed the desert settlements of the rabbis. A Jewish sect called the Essene apparently knew the end was coming. For generations, they had collected the wisdom of their people and the earliest known versions of the Old Testament. These treasures they hid in the caves that only they knew existed in the mountains behind their settlement. Nineteen centuries later, the treasure would be rediscovered. It would be a vindication of the faith of millions, evidence of the Bible as a factual history of the birth and heritage of mankind. Young rabbis pursuing their studies in Israel are the latest in a long line of revered scholars. The scripture they recite was written down centuries ago. On a barren desert shelf overlooking the Dead Sea, an ancient wisdom was thus preserved. Only a few fragments have so far been recovered. No other city has inspired such passions. Jerusalem. Her ancient walls have seen so much. Pilgrims coming from all over the world. Jews mourning past outrages in prayers before stones quarried 2,000 years ago for Herod. Muslims visiting the site of Mohammed's ascension on a hill remembered by Jews for Abraham's sacrifice. Winding past sacred monuments are streets filled with mystery. The passers-by are a polyglot of creeds and cultures. For the moment, they coexist. Yet Jerusalem is a city wearied by war. Visitors are drawn to the nearby town of Bethlehem. There, commercial banners proclaim the birthplace of the Prince of Peace. From that time to this, Bethlehem has been a trading place for nomads from Judea. In 1947, one of these nomads found his way to a small shop, hoping to sell a rotting parchment he'd found in the desert. The desert beyond Bethlehem is Judea. Green things are rare in the land of the prophets, but a spring emerges from the mountains at a place called Ein Feshka. For as long as history has been recorded here, fresh water has flowed, nourishing vegetation and refreshing wayfarers. In recent times, Ein Feshka was Arab territory, part of the kingdom of Jordan, in the Six-Day War, Israel pushed Jordan out of Jerusalem, out of Bethlehem, and out of Judea. Now, the Israelis hold the entire west bank of the Jordan River and Dead Sea. Israel's 1967 Blitzkrieg was intended to push Arab forces back to the east bank of the Jordan River and the Dead Sea, thus giving the tiny Jewish state a defensible border with its hostile neighbors. The West Bank is hostile enough without the thunder of competing armies. It is hot and dry and mountainous. The greenery and cool breezes of Jerusalem are only a short drive away, but they might as well be on the other side of the moon. Nowhere is the harsh reality of life on the West Bank more apparent than at an ancient mountain sanctuary 30 miles south of the spring at Ein Feshka. Today, cable cars make the journey to the top an easy one. In the time of Rome's dominion over the Hebrews, the trip meant climbing a trail called the Snake. By whatever route to the top, one encounters an astonishing monument to the human struggle for freedom. The place is Masada. 2,000 years ago, 
A people called the Zealots lived here. They looked at the corrupt world below and felt safe. Masada was the largest of the West Bank settlements maintained by religious patriots in defiance of Roman authority. On their mountaintop, the Zealots even had room to grow livestock and crops. From their lookouts, they could see the other side of the Dead Sea and watch invasion routes from the north. An elaborate complex of reservoirs was cut into the mountain to store runoff from rare winter rains, enough to quench Masada's thirst all summer. No enemy could approach the walls of the city without being seen. The zealots were prepared for just about everything. But they had not anticipated the tenacity of the Roman legion. The army was marching south from Jerusalem. Rome was expanding the frontiers of empire. The legionnaires brought engines of war. They were prepared for a long siege. From the summit of Masada, it is still possible to see the outlines of the Roman encampments below. The battle raged three years. By then, the zealots knew the end was near. They drew lots to implement a desperate plan. The zealots had chosen death by their own hands rather than surrender. The man chosen by lot to see the deed done had fallen on his own sword. The zealots might have been hardened in their resolve by news of what had happened at Qumran. Like Masada, Qumran was a community of devout Jews who sought refuge from oppression and immorality. Their settlement lay in the Romans' line of march from Jerusalem to Masada. Qumran was much smaller, with none of Masada's formidable defenses. Its people were more disposed to prayer than politics or war. The Romans crushed them and moved on. For perhaps 200 years, the Qumran sect had struggled for survival in the desert. They had dug a canal to carry rainwater from reservoirs in the mountains. The canal led to an elaborate system of channels inside the settlement. <laughs> 